Okay. Did anything happen to you during lunch that made you think of a question about anything we've talked about up till now? Not at all. I will make you do jumping jacks. I swear to God. Okay. Uh, somebody asked a question about scheduling. Was that you? Yeah. Um, task scheduling PowerShell scripts. Uh, relatively easy. We haven't gotten into scripts yet, but we're about to. The machine has to be enabled for script execution, which we're going to talk about next. Uh, but essentially, if you look at the command line options for PowerHell, I mean PowerShell, dot exe, it has a minus file switch. So what you would schedule is PowerShell.exe minus file, blah, 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 whatever your file name is, and that'll run it. So that's how you would schedule a PowerShell script to execute. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about scripting now. And before we talk about scripting, we need to talk about PowerShell's scripting security features. So it's really important when you talk about any kind of security system or feature to understand its goals. What is it trying to solve? Because it's really easy to just assume that every layer of security, we all agree that defense in depth is the right approach, many layers of security, each addressing different problems. It's easy to jump into the perception that every layer must address every problem. That's not the case. PowerShell's scripting security is not designed to replace your anti-malware software. Does anyone not run anti-malware software? So, where are you located and what are your IP addresses? <laughs> no. PowerShell's script security features are designed to slow down an uninformed user from accidentally running an untrusted script. Four things. An informed user? Nope. Is it designed to stop them cold? Nope. Is it designed to them from running advantage of that information? Nope. It's designed to slow down an uninformed user from accidentally, not intentionally, doing something like running an untrusted script. That's it. So the first way PowerShell achieves this, the file name extension for PowerShell scripts is PS1 for all versions of PowerShell. And that's because it's still using version 1 of PowerShell's language which is why it's installed in a folder called PowerShell E1.0. It doesn't refer to the version of the shell, it refers to the version of the scripting engine inside the shell. So PS1 is not associated with PowerShell. It is associated with Notepad, and it is not registered as an executable file type. It is registered with this as a document. Practical upshot, user gets an email, it's a file name <coughs> document, postcard to your mom about PS1, they double click it, and it simply opens up in Notepad. Relatively harmless. Now, could that user copy and paste that from Notepad into the shell and then run it from there? Yes, absolutely. That is not the unintentional, accidental act of an uninformed person outside of the scope of what PowerPoint is designed to solve. Another feature PowerShell has for scripts is that in order to run a script, you must specify a path, even if it is just the current path. You must specify a path. So, this helps you, an informed person, visually distinguish between a command and a script. Because a command would not have a file path in front of it. A script must have a file path in front of it. Fair enough? Once you do that, you can punch in whatever you're going to punch in. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Uh, the big one, and one you've probably read a decent amount about, is this one. The execution policy. PowerShell has five execution policies you can set it to. You can use this command to set it for the local machine if you are an admin. This writes to HP local machine in the registry. So if you're not a local admin, no go. You've got an access to not. You can also set this for group policy. The 
except for group policy, that overrides any local setting. If it's being set for group policy and you run this command, it will give you a warning message that says, I changed the local setting, but it won't act. But if not, I can serve the light effect. Here are the settings. First, restricted. This is the default. No scripts run. Period. No scripts. And that's how it's out of the box. You can also choose unrestricted, which means all scripts can run. For my money, just use that. Because it doesn't give you any kind of false sense of security. Middle two can kind of give you a false sense of security. One of the middle ones is called remote signed. It means any scripts running from my local computer can just run. And any scripts that come from a remote computer or which were downloaded from Internet Explorer or Outlook, which know how to put the bit in the file there and set it to the remote file, those have to carry a digital signature. All signed means all scripts have to carry a digital signature. Uh, would you like to see what the digital signature looks like? Sure, why not? Uh, Microsoft digitally signs all the files that come with PowerShell, so we can just open one of these and go all the way to the bottom, and that is the signature. You can set this yourself using set authenticode signature which is where you start to really appreciate tab completion of command names. Let's talk about what the digital signature is supposed to represent. I have a physical certificate. What is this? Driver license issued by the Certification Authority of Women in Nevada DMV. Now, if I were to take this to any of the 49 other states, they would let me probably drink at bar using that certificate. And that's because all of us trust each other's certification authorities, right? All the bars in Maryland trust the Nevada CA. Why? Why is Maryland going to take Nevada's word on my age? Higher level authority. Nope, oh, that's actually not it. <laughs> you guess it. It's because of the process. We all know that every single state uses roughly the same process to issue those certificates. Typically, the first time you got a driver's license, you had to show up with a birth certificate or something like that that proved your age. And so, because we all use that same process, we all trust that process. That's why we trust each other. Constitution notwithstanding, if it came out that you could go up to a kiosk in Nevada and get a driver's license for a buck that says whatever you want it to say, everybody would stop trusting Nevada the DMV immediately because the process became untrustworthy. Well, so when you look at your internet options in Windows, and this is Windows 8, so this is going to be extremely exciting. Yeah, I just don't have the strength for that. Let's go over here. <laughs> oh, that doesn't have a GUI on it. Awesome. All right, let's see. Alt, Windows, I, tap, tap, charm, tap, PC. Oh, God. <laughs> What's the control panel executable? C panel? I, I do have a Windows key. Windows X? It doesn't do anything. I am on a Windows machine. Look, I can do Windows R. This is Windows 8. That's not it. Anyway. Is it CPL? Oh, you mean in here? Oh, I don't like it. <laughs> and what was wrong with the old way? All right, over here on content, publishers, trusted root certification authorities. This is who you trust. These are the organizations whose process you trust. You believe that if somebody brings you a 
GTE Cybertrust ID, and it says, hi, I'm Bill Gates. Do you believe that they have verified his identity and that he is, in fact, Bill Gates? That's what this list means. And if you don't know the process used by these companies, you should take them off your list. Because if someone can get a fake Bill Gates ID and use it to digitally sign a script and get it into your environment, you won't be able to track down and kill the right guy. See, if malware can carry a digital signature, but if you have good trusts, then you can use that signature to track down the author and kill him. So only a moron would sign a piece of malware. And that's where the whole idea behind signing PowerShell scripts come from, is that if you've got a good list of trusted root certification authorities, then you're probably not going to find a digitally signed piece of malware. And if you do, you know who to go get. So from a practical perspective, most companies are running at remote sign, which means, and, and, and here's the theory. Well, all of our scripts that we run are local on our machine, so we might as well run remote sign, because that doesn't require them to be signed. All right, why not just run unrestricted? And there's no effective difference. You know, just because it's on your machine doesn't automatically make it more trustworthy. I assume you've got anti-malware that's going to keep malware from getting onto your machine, so just rely on that. So you can try to decide what direction you want to go with that. Once you've got that done, once you've set your execution policy, you can start running scripts, and you will have a fantastic time doing so. Would you like to write a script? Sure, we're here. I always start by writing a command first. Now the neat thing about the ISE here is that it is going to let me write commands and then run them all from the same little thing. So let's just add a computer name parameter to this to make it interesting. Computer name, we'll test it against localhost, uh, and I'm just going to run this, see if it works still. I know. All right, it works. Great. So here's what I'd like to do. This is a, you know, a decent little tool. It's going to uh, be something I want to give to my help desk. I want them to be able to query any computer on my network and get a quick look at the local fixed drives. They could determine if they're you know, running out of free space or anything like that. Yeah? Seem reasonable? So all we need to do is give them this file and tell them Look, before you run it, you need to open it up in Notepad, and you need to go change the computer name, not the dash computer name part. Don't change that. You've got to change where it says localhost, only it won't always say localhost because you're shit. This is not going to work out, is it? No. Okay. Let's parameterize it. Yeah? Right at the top of the script, create a little param block. This accepts a string. It's called computer name. We'll capitalize it real pretty. And I'm going to default it to localhost. Now that I have that, I'm going to put it in place of my hard-coded value. Hit save. Just to keep this fun, let's run it this way. Cool. So it defaulted to localhost and it works. Now to focus it on a different computer, it tab completed my parameter name. Did you catch that? Awesome. Now it's starting to work just like a regular PowerShell command, yeah? What do you, how do you guys feel about the idea of sticking a default value in there? You know, I used to get prompted. Who'd rather prompt? Fine. I agree. I think you're right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn on some magic. We are going to tell PowerShell that this command uses standard commandlet style parameters. And instead of setting that to a hard-coded value, I'm going to tell PowerShell that this is a mandatory parameter. And I'm going to spell it right. And now, when I run it, if I don't include a computer name, prompts me just like it does for a real command. 
Cool, right? What else? What if somebody has started to get a little bit of PowerShell training and they uh, say, you know, give me some help on this script. Well, I mean, okay. It's, it's something, I guess. It's, it's auto-generated, you know, what do you expect? How many of you are believers that scripts should carry some kind of documentation? Wow, that's good, okay. Let's put... Commandlet binding is what enables me to use this declaration and tell it that it is a, it turns on a set of features, including the ability to use this parameter declaration. It does a few other things too, which we're gonna, we'll walk through. So let's do this. That's pretty decent, right? I mean, it explains what it does and how to use it and everything else. But the neat thing is, PowerShell can read those comments using those special dotted keywords and construct a standard looking help screen. It's got my synopsis. I could put a description in there if I wanted to. It outlines the syntax. Notice that the computer name parameter is shown as mandatory because I've told it it was mandatory. And it had. Did I type an example? Ah, but I didn't say, show me the full. It'll not only add my examples, but it will helpfully number them for me and separate them all with the little dashed lines. So that one comment constructed that way, and this is called comment based help. And there's a bunch of keywords you can put in there to document different sections of it. Lots of examples in here how to do it. That one comment block serves the purpose of both constructing a help file and helping whoever's actually putting their eyeballs onto this thing. Pretty cool, yeah? I'm gonna add another column to that with the computer name. Because wouldn't it be fun if this could do multiple computers? Like with a single go? What was the symbology in the help file for a parameter that accepts multiple values? Square brackets. Square brackets. So, like that. This now accepts multiple values. Done. Of course, I need to actually code it to deal with multiple values. And the way PowerShell does that is with a scripting construct called for each. And it looks a little something like this. For each computer in computer name, meaning the second variable contains one or more values, and it's going to take those out of there one at a time and put them into the first variable. So dollar computer will only ever contain one computer name at a time. And that lets me run through my command however many times I need to to fulfill all the computer names I've been given. In variables, aren't they uh, case-sensitive variables? Variable names are not case-sensitive, no. Pretty much nothing is. Cool? You want to try it? Sure, why not? Save it. Notice my prompt. It says computer name, but what's after it? Hit enter on a blank line and you're done. That's kind of cool. And now you can use all the different ways I showed you of specifying multiple computer names. Parenthetical that reads from Active Directory, a parenthetical that reads from a file, on a separated list of names. However you can specify multiple names to this thing, it will work. Okay, 
Can we anticipate any problems with our code? No, I, uh, no, this would still work for multiple drives. Because get go do my object and select object are both perfectly capable of handling multiples. So it, it's only querying fixed drives, but if there was more than one, it would show them all. What happens if I try to connect to a computer that's not online? I did this one time at a customer and there was a computer on the network called not online. <laughs> and the command worked and I'm like, wait, what? Eh. <laughs> 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 Wouldn't it be nicer to log that to a file? Maybe, sure. Let's do this then. Try catch. Oops, 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 oops. Just, uh, let's just call it this. The trick with try catch, and a lot of people will get this far, especially if you've got a little bit of programming knowledge in your background. This is a very C flavored construct here. The command you think might explode goes into try, and then if it does explode, PowerShell will execute the catch. And it will do so in lieu of displaying an error message which is nice and clean. The problem is, in PowerShell, you have to explicitly tell a command, hey, I'm ready for you to blow up, so when you blow up, do it well, in a way I can snatch and grab. If I just run this now, I'll still get the error message text. I have to add one more parameter to this called error action, and tell it that on error, stop. The default is to continue. Display an error message and keep going. There's actually four conditions you can give it. The default is continue, display an error message and keep going. You've got inquire, which means ask the user what to do. That will never go well. The third is stop, and the fourth is the one you wish your children had, silently continue. Daddy, daddy, I stop my toast. Silently continue. Go. Uh, so we're gonna stick with stop. Save that. Let's run our command again. There is still going to be a timeout. That's a WMI feature. Can't really do much about it. But no spewy error messages. Get content errors.txt. There's my failed computer name. I want to point out that there's not a lot of programming here. Got a couple of constructs, not going to argue that for each qualifies as programming, but it's about the only thing in here that really does. Most of the rest of this is just declarative structure to tell PowerShell to do certain things. You get quite far with this. How many of you have written scripts and somewhere in the script you've had it output kind of step by step what it's doing? I call that the warm and fuzzy output, so that you kind of are aware of what's happening. Anybody familiar with a PowerShell command called write host? Yeah, you've seen this? Using my double quote trick, that will display on the screen step-by-step -step information. Problem is, write host draws pixels directly on the screen. If I was running this as a scheduled task, there's no way for me to capture that information. Write host output cannot be redirected. Can't be captured in any way. In fact, 
there are so many better ways to do that output that you should never use write host. And there's another reason you should stay away from write host. Every time you use write host, God kills a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to use write verbose instead. Save. Let's take that dead one out of there. Everyone see my verbose output? You see it now? See, this way I can turn that verbose output on or off. I didn't have to code minus verbose. I get it for free when I used commandlet binding. I also get for free another cool little feature. How many of you have ever had to debug a script? Sucks, don't it? The one way you usually debug a script, and tell me if I'm wrong here, is you'll stick in a bunch of output that kind of tells you, here's what's in all my variables, blah, 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 right? And then what happens when you're done debugging? Yeah, I always forget. To, I miss at least one. And then I hand it off to someone, and they're like, why does this say curse, 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 curse? Oh. Uh, let's do this. Run my command, runs normally, not happy with it, minus debug. Write debug pauses your script. It's like a breakpoint. I can suspend. Notice that my prompt is slightly different. It's got an extra angle bracket. I'm inside my script. Let's see what's in computer. Okay, that works. So if I do a get WMI object Win32 logical disk from that computer, yep, that worked. Okay, so this, this should work. I'll exit, and yes, you can continue. Yes, just keep going with all the rest of them. When you're done debugging, there's no need to go through and take those things out. Just take off the minus debug. That way, if you ever need to come back into this script and make changes, when you mess it up, all your debugging is still there, and you can still use it. Good? Indeed. The one thing we can't do with this script yet is pipe things to it. Because right now we haven't told PowerShell, hey, if something gets piped in, here's what to do with it. Here's the parameter to hand it to. So let's add that. It's not really that big of a deal. Value from pipeline equals true. The only difference is as soon as we add that, we have to put our main code into a named process script block. Because PowerShell is coded to look for that when you pipe something in. That's all we had to do though. So let's make sure this still works normally. Yep. And now let's take get content computers.txt and pipe that to Demo one. Starting to look and feel a lot like a real PowerShell command, isn't it? It has help. It accepts pipeline input. I can take its output and go to anything else. <coughs> Starting to really look like a real command. Not a lot of code. Started off with a command, got it working, and then wrapped some structure around it. And quite frankly, that structure is almost boilerplate. You could write 50 of these different commands that each queried some other piece of information, and they would all look almost exactly like that. Good, bad, and different questions? Very easy. So should we put that command to find one binding in front of your script? 
I do put it in just about every script I do, yeah. Yeah, it technically turns this into what's called an advanced script, or colloquially, a script command line. And the funny thing is that if you were to sit down and write a real command line, like in C-sharp, in Visual Studio, the structure would look almost identical to this. You have the same capabilities. You can even, on that parameter declaration, I can do lots of other stuff. Look, um, I'm just going to hit enter between these so I don't scroll off to the side. This is still one parameter. I used computer name as my parameter name because every other PowerShell command that accepts names does so on a computer name parameter. I'm just trying to be consistent. But is there another word for you that you might think of instead of computer name for that type of information? System? PC? Ho host name? There, now you can call it minus host name. There, now it has to have at least one computer name, but no more than 10. And there's other validates. There's validate pattern. You can validate it against a regex. If you know that your machine names should follow a certain pattern, you can write a regular expression and validate that. PowerShell will validate all that for you before it even executes your code. You can get really amazingly deep with these parameter attributes, and you don't have to do any coding to make them work. It's already built into PowerShell. You just have to tell it what feature you want to enable. Still like it? Can you add a second parameter? Can I add a second parameter? Yeah, sure. Um, trying to think what I would parameterize. So, comma. There you see the comma in there? I know this light gray is crazy, but there's a comma there. Closer. What else? Yeah, I don't have PowerShell Studio installed, unfortunately. PowerShell Studio does have a debugger in it, yeah, like a, a graphical debugger. Yeah, the ISE actually does too. I can do some of that breakpointy stuff in here as well, um, but PowerShell Studio does too. So like in here, I could put a breakpoint. Um, I forget the key press, F9. And then when I run this, it'll stop there and I can look at variables and stuff. So uh, it's, it's okay. I, you know, I'll tell you, the reason I don't use that very often uh, is because of remoting. A lot of times I'm working on my computer and it's great that it runs fine on my computer. It's when I push it to a remote computer that everything goes crazy. And the, the visual debugging doesn't work across a remoting channel. So I tend to use the very kind of low-level, right debuggy type stuff. The uh, error action that is the thing across this this template is pretty much what I, I think I remember that script running, but the type of error it encounters inside that try catch is, I guess, of a severity where if the type line would fail, it would clear out the obvious in the past. Yeah. Well, so the, the trick is is that we're not. We're not in a pipeline broadly here. I've got a pipeline running, and if it gets an error, I told it to stop, it will dump the whole pipeline and execute my catch. So the trick is, is if you actually want to do error handling, you can't do it in a one liner. You've got to have this structure around it, because it will dump the pipeline. Stop means stop. Stop everything. Which means, 
when you're running your pipeline, you need to be running against just one target at a time, which is why I have this for each loop, so that if I dump the pipeline, I've only lost one computer. I log it, and then I loop back up to get the next computer. Anything else? This is definitely very boilerplateable. Uh, I write, well, here I'll show you. I think I, uh, I think I have one I was messing around with this weekend. Is this it? Yeah, vaguely. So, you know, look at this this block here. Uh, I've written these as functions, which is the next thing I'm going to show you. But if you look, they all look remarkably alike. They all have commandment binding. They all have a param. They all have a mandatory computer name. They all have a for each. I didn't have the error handling in here to keep them short, but it's very comfortable. One of the things the new ISD has is snippets, little standalone chunks of boilerplate code. I, I literally have a snippet on my machine at home that just has this, and I drag it down, and that's my starting point, and then I kind of add a command to it, and I'm done. Like Legos. Or children's plastic interlocking blocks. My lawyer said not to say Lego. We're gonna maybe come back to this guy a little bit later. So what we've got right now is a pretty decent tool. I could absolutely give this to the help desk, let's say. Could you see yourself writing multiple tools like this? Yeah, sure. Once you get started, it's hard to quit. However, the way I've written this right now, every tool is its own standalone little PS1 file. That's going to get to be a management nightmare, just in terms of keeping track of the files. Let's make this a little bit more flexible. All I've done is wrap this in a function declaration. That's it. Now here's the magic part, and this is where you can go wrong very easily. File, save as. Go to your documents library and make absolutely certain you are looking at my documents, not public documents. Create a folder, which I have already created, called Windows PowerShell. It will not be there by default. In there, create a folder called modules. Now, create a folder for this tool set. I will call it my tools. And because I called it my tools, I need to have the file name be my tools. Folder and file name must match. Dot PSM1. I'm going to go to a completely separate standalone shell here. Get disk size info. Tab completed it. PowerShell already found that this thing exists on disk. Give me the computer name DC. If I run get module, it loaded the My Tools module when I did that. So I just made a redistributable module. I can put as many functions as I want into that single file, and they will all load and unload as a group. And you'll notice when I ran it, now that it's a function in a module, it no longer needs a path in front of it. It's a command now. It's a real little boy. <laughs> all applies to 2.0. Yep. Yeah, only difference is 2.0 won't auto load it like that. I would have had to manually run import module to load the module in, and then I could run the command. So now I can start to really build a tool library there. How many of you think you might want to have kind of a central, rather than keeping this all in your documents folder, maybe do you have, my understanding is there's a technology called file server that lets you put stuff in like a central place where everyone can share it. Do you have that? Uh, easy, easy fix. Get content, environment variables, PS module path. 
This is a Windows environment variable, just like path and computer name and all that other garbage. You can set this in a group policy object. Add a semicolon to the end of it and give it a UNC. PowerShell will look for modules there as well as in these two default locations so that anyone who has that can then find that module and run the commands. Neat, huh? It's like smart people thought about this stuff. Say that again? Finally. Finally. <laughs> Have you met Jeffrey Snover? Take a minute to talk to him after the keynote. He's a, he's a bright, bright guy. He, he came from DEC. So, yeah, those digital guys, they knew what they were up to. Yeah. They were really up to it. He is quite the AS400 fan and some DMS, as am I, which is where this whole bird down thing came from. That's how uh, AS400 commands were constructed, too. There's a lot of, of borrowed bits and bobs in PowerShell from things that have worked for decades in other OSs. It's like you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you can just borrow it. So, this module stuff is, is really, really powerful stuff. I want you to uh, tell you a little story. I have a, a client that's a big pharmaceutical, and they're, you know these pharmaceuticals are heavily regulated and everything else, and so their IT is actually done by a separate corporation that they set up just to do IT so that it wouldn't have to be regulated. And so it does IT services to all of their other bazillion pharmaceutical subsidiaries. Uh, a couple of years ago, they had me out to do some PowerShell, and they had decided that they were so tired of doing things manually that they were not going to put up with it anymore as a company. It was costing too much money. They said, look, we figured out it takes us four minutes to create an active directory because they filled out a lot of information in an API. Every time we spent that four minutes, it was money lost. We will never, ever, ever get that four minutes back because every time we do it, it's another four minutes. So we create 300 new years a day. And so wait a minute. That's like two people's full time job. They said, Yeah, we got it. <laughs> we don't want to do it anymore. So, talk PowerShell. They modified the job description for their top level network engineer. Like, here's your three, three, four guys. Their jobs were to go find wasted time and provide automation. They said, Now, if it takes them three days to come up with the script, that's fine. If it's once it's written, we get that time back. That's an investment. We run the script. It second now every single time. And they told all their guys in the second tier, here's the deal, we don't want second tier anymore. We don't want people who push buttons. We want people who write scripts and people who run scripts. If you write scripts, you're going to get paid a lot. If you run scripts, not so much. You've got two years from the day of this class to get yourself into the top tier. And they set up metrics. Every year you had to go find 20 hours of work and automate that 20 hours of and four people just got laid off. They said, we will move every single one of you into the top here. We will give every single one of you more money just to sit around and write scripts. Four people didn't embrace it, didn't get there in two years, and lost their jobs. And the company is delighted with this new structure. Their tier three guys never talk to users, ever. They love their lives. <laughs> <laughs> And the help desk is happier because now every single time the help desk runs into a problem, it goes into the tracking system, right? That's, you guys all have data tracking system. They're very careful about monitoring their close time. And the minute a particular problem starts to surface in the top of the report in terms of consuming time, it gets automated. Now the help desk guy is just run a script and it fixes the problem and it closes the ticket right there. So they run into their jobs better. That's where this goes. You are either going to be a cool user or a cool maker. And trust me, you want to be a cool maker. So think about how you can save time. How about your job description? It makes the company commit to giving you the time. It makes it a formal recognition. It's not just reading the script copy, right? This is the real thing then. Uh, but you definitely, you know, it's, it's get down to this program or learn how to say, you like prizes that. Those are kind of the options now. So 
right? Not from the burgers for our profession. What, uh, what other questions you want to ask about this? Anything? Where's this parameter up here? Do you have to say parameter a second time? Uh, it does. Yes, so, so if I wanted to assign some attributes to the drive type, yes. I would do that whole declaration again. All those things, those four lines that go with computer name are all one parameter. And then a comma, and then the next hunk. Yeah, you can you can call another PS1 from within a PS1. That's fine. I mean, they really all they are is a batch file. They just have a little bit more structured programming than a, a command.exe batch file would. So they're somewhere between a batch file and like VB script, which is just all programming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're talking SQL 2008? Yeah. Yeah, piece of garbage. <laughs> Those guys, for a number of reasons that I'm sure were perfectly understandable at the time, their implementation of PowerShell in that version of SQL was called a mini shell, and it was a non extensible shell that could only do what they gave you. That was a deliberate, it's not a security thing. That concept has been thrown in the trash. It only occurred in SQL 2008 and will never occur anywhere else ever. They're very sorry. You should see my blog post from about back then. It was a little heated. The intent was good. Uh, the intent with that was you can run anything you want to in PowerShell, but we're going to give you this locked down version. If you call product support and say, I can't make this script work, they're going to say, well, does it work in the mini shell? And if you say yes, they're going to say, your problem is no, it won't work in the mini shell. Okay, well, it must be our fault because we know what's happening in there. Again, it was great, but constraining you to that support environment from within the main pool is just dumb. And I'll lay it out. So do you think that you would just create one of these prompts for, say, HRRC applications or connect directly to prompts for each separate? Yeah, you could absolutely write one of these that HR could run and the model field, and you can even do some validation or whatever else you need under the hood, and then run a command. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and if you start think about some of the other stuff I told you, create a remoting endpoint that runs under all tenant credentials. Only HR can get in, and this is the only command that lives there. So they can run it, and they can only do what that command is going to do, but it's going to do it under elevated permission, so they don't have to actually have permission. And then you can wrap a GUI on the front side of that for them. Yeah, I mean. Do you also do the exchange side of that as well? You do everything you want to. Exchange is fine, absolutely. New mailbox, blah, 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 blah. You can write the whole provisioning script. People decide when they're in the front door. There's this concept that's kind of starting to float around the Microsoft side of the, the IT world called DevOps. Anybody run across that word? Yeah. It means. Developers who spend more time in operations understanding what operational needs are like, hey, great app, I gotta back that up. No, it doesn't have a back up. Problem. So it's developers taking a little bit more interest in what happens in operations, and operations guys, us, taking a little bit more coding under our belt. Because Microsoft is just gonna deliver us a platform. It's not gonna do every little thing that every little company is doing process is required. They're delivering a generic platform. We have to write glue that makes the platform do what our company needs. And this is where that comes in. If it seems like, wow, I'm, I'm halfway to becoming a programmer, yes, and that's good. Because every single other piece of the IT industry has always been that way forever. Anybody with Unix background? <coughs> yeah, so if I walk up to a Unix guy and say, uh, do any programming? Like, yeah, all day, right? 
I asked 100, that's all I did. I wrote CL batches. You know, Cisco, same thing. We were just new to it in the Microsoft world. But it's not our fault. I would have been afraid. We've never been given the tools that let us do it effectively. And I was like, that was Bill, wasn't it? Because he, he set up GUI for everything. He didn't want to show me anything. Yeah, Bill, though. you get all this stuff in there, it does become intimidating, but that's not the starting point. I know that you go out to the internet and you're stealing from some of my fellow MVPs, many of whom are full-time software developers, and their example is a 900-line open magnum script from the garage. It starts there. You're just seeing the end result of six years of experience. So, start at the beginning. And like I said, I've got a few copies of books we're not done. Um, but what time is it? Two o'clock. Uh, let's go for about 15 more minutes. We'll take a little break. <clears throat> this is a stepping stone on the next thing I'm going to do, which is reporting. However, in the meantime, there's one other little permutation of this I want to get you involved in which is making changes. So let's go to a normal shell for this. It'll make me feel a little better. Ah. By the way, who gets a little freaked out when they get a screen full of red text? Right? You go right back to English class, don't you? Curl into a fetal ball. I'm sorry, Mom. I got a C minus. That feels better. That feels like you did something right. <laughs> All right. Oh, NT event log file. Win thirty two. Why is that not working? Yeek. Gigantic font. Better. Get to me on object win32 nt event log file. Nothing. So I don't have any event logs. Uh.
right? Solving our own problems. Oops. List. Let's let that run for a second. Part of the, the point of PowerShell is being able to change management information. So far, I've really just been retrieving it. I'm going to show you some examples. There are really three different ways that you can execute change in PowerShell, and there is a definite order of preference. The first is a command. If there is a command that will do what you need to be done, use it. Real simple. For example, there's a command nt event log file. I don't know how I type that any differently. Huh, whatever. There, it has some. So for example, if you needed to change something in the event log, like uh, change the rollover policy, right? What do you guys use for rollover? As needed, pretty much. <coughs> Anybody? Does anyone use as needed, overwrite as needed? Yeah, okay. There's a command for that, I think. PowerShell's acting goofy. Oh, it's, it's limit. I got it. Limit event log. So if you need to make a change and there's a command that does it, use the command. Always, 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 always. Always the best way to do it. Sometimes, though, there isn't a command to do what you want. But if you can get to it using a WMI method, here's what you can do. Uh, let's do this with the security log. What could go wrong? Filter log name log file name equals security. Notice that I'm taking this one bit at a time, making sure I'm getting back what I expect before I invoke WMI. Here, let's do this on two lines. Invoke WMI method name backup log or maybe clear log. New syntax. There we go. I don't know why my event logs are all whack, but invoke method, WMI method will let you run. So that's an alternative to a command. Okay? Basic type of change. Anybody have internet connection in here? Oh, I might have an internet connection. How, uh, how often do you guys change your user passwords? 60? 90? Any 30s? Man, I hate the 30s. We, um, when I was at Bell, we had a 45-day policy. But the division I managed, we migrated everybody from NetWare to NT in one night. And so everybody's password countdown started on the exact same moment. Yeah, what do you think happened 45 days later? I shut off password expiration is what happened. Because our help desk was like, we're going to quit. Uh, our corporate auditor, do you guys have auditors that check stuff like that, I assume? Yeah, they would always give us a couple days heads up so I could turn it back on. They'd come in, it's set, they're happy, turn it back off. Um, you do what you gotta do. How often do you change your service account passwords? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it's a pain in the neck, right? Managed service accounts is easier, yes. But, but for if you're not using those, and because not every service can, it gets to be a hassle. So here's what I do. Let's look at Win32 service. Oops, change method. This will let you change a number of different aspects of a service. Do you see password on the list? 
Yeah, start password. Which parameter is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. I got to get this right, so you got to back me up here. Eight. Yes. Okay. The trick with this is you pass it null for the first seven if you don't want to change those, and it leaves those alone. And then you give it a value for password, and you're you're good. That's how you can change the password. Now the problem is invoke WMI method here, he doesn't like null arguments. So I'm not going to be able to use that. So here's what I will do instead. Do, 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 new file. Get WMI object, class. Filter, log file name equals security. Oops, no, we're doing services, aren't we? Service, filter. Um, I need one that's not going to be awful if I break it. How about bits? That only breaks Windows Update. Nobody cares about that. Because I can't pass nulls to invoke WMI method, I'm going to have to go through these things manually. Dollar sign underscore continues to represent whatever was piped in. Period. Change. Count with me. One. This is eight. And then run. Wow. Where did I miss? Oh. See, it's even got the little squiggly under there. You see it? Like Word. But I forgot that. There we go. WMI will always give you a return value back. Zero is good. Anything else is bad. And then you Google the class name and hope that they've documented whatever error message you got. Probably not. Uh, but this worked. And so this for each object works a lot like the for each construct that we just looked at in the script. It takes whatever you pipe it and it executes this script block once for each object that you piped in. And the dollar sign underscore represents whatever you piped in. I don't want the whole thing, so I use a dot, the change method, and then in parentheses I list out my arguments. So that's the third way you can make changes to something in PowerShell. First a command, if you can't do that, try invoking a WLI method. If you can't do that, this is your fallback position. You don't have to start and stop the service? Well, it won't try and use the password until I log it back on. But yeah, I mean, if you want to have it, it'll continue to run even with the password changed. You just better have gotten it right the next time it starts. I'm pretty sure this isn't it, but. My bits service is probably completely hosed right now anyway, so I'm sorry. So is change, is that a, a action? Or? Change is a method. It is an, it is an action that is associated with the Win32 service class. And you know where I first found it? By taking things one step at a time. If you... Uh, just run this much of this and pipe it to GM. I saw a change listed as a method right there. I got all excited because I didn't see a change password. I thought, well, maybe change is generic. And so I, I went to the goo and I looked it up and, and lo, there it was. A lot of folks will get frustrated, they're like, I don't know how I would have found that. Trial and error, goofing around and reading up on the internet, you already know how to do that. There is no easier way. That is part of what our job is. Unfortunately, stuff like this is not all documented and laid out for us very well. So questions on that? Nope. Last chance for questions on the function? Okay. We are going to blow it out of the water when we come back from break. It's, uh, let's come back at, oh, I got 206. Let's come back at 220. Maybe not quite 15 minutes, yeah? 220.
The last thing we're going to do is take functions that retrieve several pieces of information from several different places and construct a dynamic, visually beautiful HTML report suitable for framing, posting on a web server, or attaching to an email. And I will show you how to do all of those things except the framing part. So, uh, 220. have an idea of how to plan the rest of your week. Uh, was anybody planning to come to one of my PowerShell sessions on Wednesday? I'm doing one on remoting and one on tool making. Skip it. You're not going to learn a bunch more than you've learned here. Uh, love to see you again. By all means, come hang out. Uh, but we've gone over the vast majority. There's a few things we'll get into a little bit more depth with uh, in those, but by and large, you've seen it. So if you want to spend your time elsewhere, feel free. Uh, here's what we're going to do next. One of the biggest things I see people doing with PowerShell is creating management reports. Um, inventory reports, status reports, whatever else. Uh, you were mentioning you, you wanted to run that as, that was your scheduled task as a report you wanted to run. Great, great idea. PowerShell is really good at it because it can reach out and get a lot of information. I, I, <clears throat> me, I'm not the guy to spend a lot of time trying to manipulate Excel spreadsheets. I know a lot of folks like to deliver their reports that way. That's totally cool. It's just. My head tends to go for something that, for me, is a little bit more approachable and reusable, because manipulating Excel is hard. So I like to go for HTML. Now, you've already seen the base HTML that PowerShell produces. Just to kind of emphasize, you know, you can run something pretty basic. Yeah, it's recording. And then we'll do to do. This is the base HTML PowerShell spits out. It's not beautiful, but you know, it's functional, I guess. What would you say if I told you you could get something like this? Different sections, nice big heading at the top, sections that expand with a paged, sortable, click to sort table. Ooh. You like that? Isn't that prettier? Well, here's how it's done. In addition to Secrets of PowerShell Remoting up on PowerShellBooks.com, there's another free ebook I just put up this weekend called Creating HTML Reports in PowerShell. It comes with a module for you to drop onto your system, and that module is called Drum roll. Enhanced HTML. It adds two commands. One command, and you're going to see how all this pulls together. Uh, this demo script is also in with the book. So you'll get all of this if you download it. One command is called convert to enhanced HTML fragment. And that's designed to create a single section of the report with its own little heading and whatever table, list, whatever you want. The second is called convert to enhanced HTML, and it takes all of your fragments and creates the final report. You have a few options that I'm going to point out here. Uh, there is some JavaScript that comes along with the, the functionality. You can have that pulled from Microsoft's content delivery network, which is very speedy. Or you could download those scripts manually, host them on your own intranet, and point to that location instead. Whatever works for you. Once you've done this, the resulting file can be dropped onto a web server and viewed. It can be distributed as an email attachment and viewed. Or it can even be made into the body of an email. So it just pops right up in Outlook and is there. Really, really flexible way of delivering reports. Once you've created the script that creates the report, you can schedule it. Have your reports go out automatically. So let's do a little quick walkthrough. Um, was there a question? Uh, creating HTML reports in PowerShell. If you go to PowerShellBooks.com, it's not a gigantic web page. And it's one of the two free books right at the top of the page. And it says free books. It's pretty easy to track down. Um, let's say again. 
module free? Everything's free. It's all Creative Commons licensed. If you download that book, it's a zip file with the book in PDF and EPUB and the module and the demo script and a couple others. And it walks you through an explanation of how it works too. I didn't just give it to you. But I'm gonna walk it through now. Um, I did write help for everything, so it is all documented. You'll notice that this, this is the script that produces the report. It is not the module itself. It uses the module. So I've used commandlet binding. I'm accepting one or more computer names, and I'm accepting a path. The trick with this path is it is just a path. It is a folder. In that folder, the script is going to create a file for each computer you give it. So if you give it server one, server two, server three, you'll get server one.html, server two.html, server three.html in whatever folder you tell it. That's how it works. The first thing it does is import the enhanced HTML module. Then it creates a cascading style sheet. So I'm just really dumping this CSS syntax into a variable called style. How many of you have web guys or gals in your, your shop? If you want to get them to make you a pretty style sheet and then give it to you, you can literally copy and paste it into that. And that's probably the easiest way. If you don't want to get into the deep, dark depths of CSS, and trust me, I wish I never had, um, that brain cell's gone, uh, then get them to do that. You can also, uh, just if you, if you have an intranet web server, which I imagine you do, you can have them put the style sheet on the server and you can link to it instead of embedding it in here, another option. So I've created that, and then I'm defining, and this is what I was showing you earlier, a bunch of functions that just go get some info. The first one's grabbing some information about the operating system, the version, the service pack version, and the build number. Computer system, uh, I'm grabbing the manufacturer, I'm doing some math on the physical memory because I don't care how many bytes of RAM I have installed. I'm interested in bigger bytes. Number of procs and the number of logical procs. So that's uh, sockets and cores, right? How many of you have a lot of XP in your shop still, by the way? Be aware that this processor thing works a little bit differently on XP. It thinks, uh, it, because it came out before the advent of multi-core processors, those two numbers will always be the same. It thinks every logical processor, every core, is a socket. So its math is going to be a little off for you. Uh, I'm then retrieving information on services whose startup type is set to automatic, but that isn't running. So those are all services I might need to pay attention to. Should be started, but aren't. Uh, I'm getting some information on current running processes and information on all the physical network adapters. Uh, the name, speed, manufacturer, and MAC address. So these are all just defined as functions. This is the first line of actual executable code. I'm going to run through each computer that I was given. Now because I've got like five queries that I'm executing, I just want to take a quick second and make sure that I can reach the computer. So I'm arbitrarily querying the Win32 BIOS class from WMI. I don't care about it. I don't plan to do anything with the information. I just want to see if it works. If it doesn't work in my text block, I'm changing a variable called everything okay to false. And I will only do the rest of my script if everything okay remains true. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to why I did this instead of issuing a ping, which would have been a lot simpler? Well, your network's down, your server's up. Yeah, a firewall could be blocking ping, but allowing RPCs for WMI. Just because a ping works does not mean WMI is going to work. The repository could be corrupted, its service could be stopped, its port could be blocked. So I'm trying to do the same thing the rest of my script is going to try to do. So I get down here, and this is, uh, so I'm creating my file path. I'm joining whatever path you gave me as a parameter to this computer name, .html. And this is a technique I want to specifically point out. Remember I said earlier not to call an asterisk a splat? This is actually called splatting. In the variable params, I have created a hash table 
There's that at sign curly bracket construct. But this time I'm a little bit freeform. The first element in each item is a parameter name as pre content table CSS ID and div CSS ID. And they're being set equal, that's an equal sign in there, which is probably hard to read because of the coloring. And giving them the values for those parameters. So rather than typing out all my parameters in one long line that scrolls off to the right continuously, I get to construct them in here and then look at my command, convert to enhanced HTML fragment, at sign params, feeds it the parameters out of that variable. Just a prettier way of putting together a long block of parameters. So I'm creating HTML fragments for the operating system and for the computer system. These are being styled as a list. And you can see that in the final report because it lists the information rather than displaying it in a grid. For the next ones, processor, services, and NICs, I'm styling them as a table. This is that little diamond character that shows up there. And I'm assigning some CSS classes, including even and odd row classes, so that the even and odd rows in the table can be styled differently. That's how I was able to get every other row to be gray instead of every row being white. So I retrieve the information, convert it to an enhanced HTML fragment, out it to a string, and it goes into the variable. Once I've done that with all of them, this is the last block of code. I give it my style sheet. Alternately, I could have said CSS URI and given it the URL of the style sheet on the internet. I give a title for the overall report, uh, some, uh, a heading for the overall report, that's the pre-content, tell it which tables I want to make into dynamic, sortable, dynamic, interactive tables, give it a list of my HTML fragments, and it creates the report. So using this as a template, you could put any kind of information you want, and you've got multiple examples of different presentations that you can go with. So when you look at the final report, OS and computer system are in a list, and these sections are not hideable. All right, I can't click them. This section is a table, and it's hideable. Toggleable, whatever you want to call it. So you can create a really impressive thing without doing a ton of work. Aside from the fact that I used this splatting technique for my parameters, this is really just running commands. There's not a lot of code. It's a bunch of parameters and commands. The book obviously has a much more detailed walkthrough of line by line and everything else. You're more than welcome to go through that. And it does come with this example. And you get the entire module and it tells you where to put it and everything else. Something you think you get some use out of? I'm genuinely curious because I just threw this up there because I, I needed to figure it out for a client. But is something useful? You can even get to the point, because you can assign all these CSS IDs and classes separately, you can make one table blue and another table green and all sorts of wacky stuff and make it very flashy, pretty, blinky, garbage. Your webhead people can help you figure out the styles. Um, but because PowerShell actually emits fairly clean HTML, it's possible to really get creative with the style on it once you add these IDs. This is what my module does for you. Cool. If you ran this against a hundred or so computers, would you see it taking a while? Yeah. Would it be nice to maybe run it in the background? Sure. Would you like to see how? Okay. This is probably the last thing we'll do. Three ways to start a background job in PowerShell. First way, start job. Give it a job to run. That'll take a minute. Second way, remember remoting? Oops. Hmm. 
minus as job. Throw that minus as job in there and it goes on the background thread. Last way, WMI. Hello. As job. Get job. There's all my jobs. Your status of these will show you the worst case for each computer that was involved. So when job number four there is telling me failed, uh, if I had had multiple computers, some of them might still have succeeded. Fail is the worst case. Uh, in this case, I've just got one computer there, so that obviously went wrong. Look at the job ID numbers. Seem a little out of order? Missing some, right? Each of these is a parent job. They each have child jobs. So if I get job ID 6 and ask select object to expand the child jobs property, I can see that jobs 7 and 8 are actually the child jobs and each of them is actually running against a single computer. Uh, my DC is failing because in order to make my HTML report, I had to switch my virtual machine's network over to a private network so it can no longer see my domain controller, but it's also a good way to show you what can go wrong here. So now that I, I do have some data back, you'll notice that this one worked fine and has more data. Receive, the CI before E except after C, job ID 8. So it stores that data in memory until you receive it out. Once you do receive it out, it's gone. It does not keep a copy unless you were to say minus, oops, minus keep. That would give it to you and keep a copy in memory. Let's see if that one is still, no, it actually finished. Wow, fastest directory ever. Get command noun job. Removing a job will delete the job definition and any data it has stored up. Uh, you can suspend and resume a job. You can stop a job, so if it's running and you feel it's run away and you're tired of waiting for it. And wait job is interesting. Wait job, you tell which job you want to wait for and the status you want to wait for and the shell will pause until that job reaches that state. So in a script, for example, if you wanted to have five or six things happening simultaneously, you could kick them all off as jobs, and then your script would say, wait until these jobs are all complete. Then your script would pause until the job's finished, and then once they all finished, it would move on. You get very programmery with this stuff. Jobs exist entirely inside PowerShell. These are not definitions, these are not scheduled tasks. There is a way to integrate these with scheduled tasks in Windows 8 and Server 2012. But if I close this window, these go away completely. If I have a separate window open, it can't see what's going on inside this one. Oh. We've covered a lot of ground here, and I feel like you're all sleepy. There's a lot, a lot, a lot further you can go in PowerShell, obviously. Um, PowerShell has complete access to the entire .NET framework. You can dive in and pull up classes, and you start to get a little bit more like a C-sharp programmer at that point, but if you're comfortable with that, there's a lot of functionality down there. All of the commands we've been running are all written in .NET. Most of the time, they're simply wrapped around those classes. So it provides an easier, more documented way of getting at it, but if there's something missing, you can always dive into there yourself and dig it out, which you'll see a lot of folks on the internet do, especially my my fellow MVPs who are developers, because it's what they're more comfortable with. Don't ever look at someone else's PowerShell work and think for a moment that that's the only way that can be done. That's the way they do have. Doesn't mean it's the best way, doesn't mean it's the easiest way, it's what got the job done for them, and that made it the right way for them. But if it doesn't make sense to you, then look for another way. Uh, that's what websites like PowerShell.org are for, so you can go ask a question. Hey, look, I found this example URL. I, I can't make heads or tails of this. Is there an easier way to do this? Oh, yeah, you can run this command. 
have an origin like that. I've seen a lot of people construct 500 line scripts to replace one command that was already in the product. That's the biggest thing that You guys don't ask questions and finish early. All right, that is the end of where we're going to go today. But we've walked through running commands, we've walked through parameters, we've walked all the way through building our own tools to produce a report. One last little tip. Uh, I don't show this to folks up front. I usually kind of wait until the end because it's a little bit of a crutch. I get a little bit weary of handing out crutches super early because then people will lean on them the whole time. But when you look at a command with all the parameters strung out, do you have some trouble at this point still kind of parsing the syntax and seeing what's what? Is there anyone who thinks, yeah, maybe I, maybe I can get it right the first time, but it take a little trial and error? Yeah? Here's the crutch. This is a version three thing, too. It's not in version two. Show command. Get w my object. Show command is the command. The command I want it to show me is get w my object. Make sense? A lot like the help command. Same kind of syntax. This pops up a GUI. Pops up a GUI so that you can complete the command line which is actual irony. If anyone happens to talk to Alanis Morissette, this is irony. Um, punch in your class, win32 service. Uh, let's put in a filter name equals bits. Computer name, local host. Do me a favor, if you need to use this crutch, it's cool, totally, totally on board with that. Never hit run, because it's not gonna help. Hit copy and then paste. And that's what the command should look like. If you use that crutch that way, it will help you learn how to do PowerShell syntax. So it's a great, great crutch for that. As you start to use some of the new management tools, Exchange Server tools have done this for a long time, the new Active Directory Administrative Center does, a lot of tools will show you the PowerShell that are running under the hood. That's another great way. Go into the GUI, it's comfortable, complete the task, but look at the PowerShell and make yourself parse it. Um, how many of you uh, sleep on your side when you sleep at night? So, you know, for the next couple nights until this sinks in, maybe some cotton in the ears so nothing moves out. <laughs> but go home and try this. Go home, find a task that needs automating, and jump in and do it. Get stuck. Get yourself unstuck. Ask for help. We only learn by making mistakes and getting stuck. That's how our brains are wired up. How many of you have kids? You ever tell them to not touch the hot pan on the stove? Did they touch it? How many times? Once. Was it the once? Because that's how we learn. Me standing up here and telling you this isn't you learning. It's you just becoming aware of what the product can do. And this has really just been a, a full day of feature tour. You gotta go home and do it and mess it up and get yourself unmessed. Then you learn. So go home and find something and set yourself a task and set yourself a goal and get stuff and get through it. And it's going to be tough because the first time it's going to take you a lot longer than it would just take it the way you already know how, right? And that's going to be frustrating, but that's an investment. And it will pay back, I promise. So, last chance for questions. With one exception, um, you know, you, you, can, you can do a pretty good job running most commands, uh, especially the simpler ones, ping, uh, ipconfig slash all. You know, these things work the way you're used to. NS lookup will run. You'll get some commands, uh, cackles is one that comes to mind, where its syntax is pretty complicated and it confuses PowerShell. PowerShell will try to do stuff with it that kind of freaks it out. So in PowerShell 3, there's a new operator. You put that before any external command and PowerShell will just run it as is and it won't try to think about it.
So, but yeah, apart from that, how many of you still use command.exe from time to time? Knock it off. Stop it. Start using this instead. That said, don't overthink it too much. Right? Um, PowerShell version 3 fixes this, but prior to that, version 2, I used to tell my classes, okay, you're in PowerShell, how would you have a network drive? And I'd start doing it, and I'm like, stop. Matt Hughes, you already know how to do this. Well, that's not the PowerShell way. Who cares? Zero points per style, none. So if you already know the command line way to do something, and it will fit the need, use it. Fine. The whole point of PowerShell making those accessible was so that you could be more productive right away. Do that. And stop using command.x and start getting into the shell, the real shell. Cool. How about network places? How about network places? Do you use network places? Yeah. Instead of network places, my time drive. That's, that's a client thing. I don't know. I'm a server guy. I also uh, only have one client that actually uses map drive anymore. So, you know that's why, do you know why some Microsoft no longer put map drives in user policies? They haven't used them for years as a corporation. They just sat down one day and said, we're putting up DMS trees, everyone's going to learn NCDs, and if you don't like it, you can quit your job. Bye. <laughs> and lo and behold, everyone was able to remember DMCs. It was fine. Um, so yeah, a lot of my clients have switched over to that. I actually don't have a lot of clients that use a lot of scripts or anything anymore. I know. I'm blessed. Does the shell always need to be run with elevated permissions? That depends. Do you need to do something that requires elevated permissions? Then yes. A lot of commands do have a credential parameter. Like if you're shipping commands off by remoting, you can provide an alternate credential. So that's good. Um, but in general, if the title bar doesn't say administrator, you're not an administrator. You're just UAC. Would you cover your I don't even know what I'm doing on the afternoon. Tell me. Oh, we'll make. Yeah. Uh, creating a module, um, which we did. You know, command, the script, the function, the module. Um, a lot of what we just went over here. Now, I read somewhere that you convert this into a C sharp. Is it a utility or something? No, aside from doing a translation, but C sharp doesn't have direct access to any of the commands. Right? It would have to bring that class in a lot heavier, totally possible, but it's a little bit more than just a translation. And you cannot compile PowerShell into an executable that does not require PowerShell. It is, an, it is loosely speaking, an interpreted language. PowerShell version 3 actually runs in a DLR that doesn't have a language runtime, so when you run a command, to a native object code at a very, very, very low level for performance. The performance of version 3 is great, but that doesn't necessarily mean it converts to C sharp. It's, it's more akin to tokenized IL. 